on this episode of Jeff Does Vegas. From my earliest memories, I remember him always having music playing in the house and him playing air guitar and pretending to play trumpet to Chicago and all this. He just was always, there was always music. And, and he took me to see uh, Santana play at uh, the convention center uh, in 1976. So I was six years old when I went and I remember seeing Carlos on stage. And, and I remember the sound coming out of that electric guitar. I remembered the power of it. I mean, it just moved my soul. And um, I remember that experience to this day. Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 129 of Jeff Does Vegas. Before we get into this episode of the podcast, I want to thank everyone who checked out the last episode of the show, where we took a deep dive into the tragic events of October 1st, 2017, and the shooting at the Route 91 Harvest Country Music Festival. We heard about the response to the shooting from people in the city and around the world, how Las Vegas has healed since this incident, and we examined the question that to this day, five years later, still remains unanswered. Why? If you haven't listened as of yet, jump into the archives at jeffdoesvegas.com or search out episode number 128, 10 1 17, five years later, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, here we go. On to the show. If you're a lover of that vintage Vegas vibe, but also a huge fan of a more contemporary rock sound, you're going to love my guest for this episode of the podcast. Michael Shapiro is the front man for the band Reckless in Vegas, who, after spending the last several years hustling their asses off all over the city at various lounges and showrooms, recently landed their first ever residency gig at the legendary Sahara. Michael shared what initially got him interested in music. We talked about his early days working in cover bands and touring with other artists. He opened up about his addiction and recovery and what inspired him to create the unique sound of Reckless in Vegas. Please enjoy my conversation with Michael Shapiro. I'm actually a transplant, but but I but I started here at one. So so 1971. My dad moved to Vegas in 1970 from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was born in San Jose, California, uh, but my mom and my dad were both Bay Area brats. And um, my dad moved to Vegas. My mom they divorced. My mom moved to Portland. So for the first few years of my life, I kind of went back and forth. But basically, been in Vegas since 1971. And what was it that initially brought your dad to Las Vegas? His his father, Barney Shapiro, uh, you know, he had a hotel here in 1955. He moved here in that around that time. And then in the in the 70s, he started a company called United Coin um, slot slot machines. So he actually invented and manufactured gambling devices. uh, And so he had a company here. And so he got my dad to come here to work for him. So what was it then that got you involved in? in music were your parents musically inclined at all did your mom or dad play yeah my mom played a little singer songwriter style guitar and sang a little bit uh i don't have many memories of of her doing that just very few but it was really my dad my dad is not a musician but he's a you know like you he's an incredible music lover he just just passionate about music and from my earliest memories i remember him always having music playing in the house and him playing air guitar and pretending to play trumpet to Chicago and all this. He just was always, there was always music. And, and he took me to see uh, Santana play at uh, the convention center uh, in 1976. So I was six years old when I went and I remember seeing Carlos on stage and, and I remember the sound coming out of that electric guitar. I remembered the power of it. I mean, it just moved my soul. And um, I remember that experience to this day. And in fact, I talk about it in the show uh, every night. And um, 
that was my biggest influence. And I look back on it thinking that, you know, well, it was the music that, that inspired me to want to be a musician, but it was really looking back in, in retrospect, it was really the adoration that the audience felt toward Carlos, me included. I wanted to be loved like that. And, and that sort of was the starting point. Of course, I, I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. Right. But looking back, I realized that's what it was. And that sort of tricked me into, into the, into, into wanting to play music. And I, I built my first guitar out of a tennis racket, uh, my dad, we didn't have enough money to buy an electric guitar. I wanted an electric guitar because I wanted that. I wanted to feel that power. And I took a tennis racket and I broke three turntables. I took the stylus out of them, touched the wires together until I, I got them to play through a stereo, you know, through a mic, microphone input jack. And, uh, and, and my dad came home and saw the broken turntables and I played the guitar for him with rubber bands on it. He went and bought me my very first guitar. I was about 11 years old when he bought me that guitar. And uh, it was a hundred dollar harmony guitar. And I traded uh, Atari tapes, uh, the old Atari games. I tra traded those, my, my seven best tapes for uh, or games for a Univox amplifier. And I Frankenstein that too. I was always into taking things apart and putting them back together and trying to make things more than they were. And uh, you're creative when you're broke, right? The, the poorer you are, the more creative you are. And, and, um, and that's how it got started. But, you know, like in the, in the, in the 80s, uh, early 80s, late 70s, I remember my dad, he had 755 eight track tapes. They were all categorized and alphabetized. Um, when it switched to cassette tapes, he would come home, you know, a couple times a week with a stack of cassettes and he'd say, Hey, hey kid, listen to this. And it would be, you know, uh, Howard Jones, or it would be U2, U2's first album, or it would be just like this incredible uh, range of music he would always be turning me on to. And, and I think that was probably my primary influence, but I, my first instrument was trumpet. A kid that we play with now who's not a kid anymore. He's in the show with us. He's a phenomenal trumpet player, plays with Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett and he's, he's all over the map, uh, uh, played with Frankie Valley. He's a, he's an incredible horn player. I saw him play in sixth grade. So I think what we're about 11 then at that point, maybe I think. And, uh, and my dad had a trumpet for some reason. He had this beautiful silver olds uh, in the case with a receipt in it. He never played. He just pretended to play it, you know. And I, I snuck it out of his closet and took it to school. Um, and then the following year, I played trumpet in seventh and eighth grade with Danny Falcone and a couple other friends of mine. That was my introduction to any kind of organized music, you know, or learn how to read. Um, uh, but the guitar was always the, the thing, right? I wanted the guitar. Plus, you know, guitar got girls. I don't think trumpet really got girls. <laughs> Yeah, they, there's there's not. I, I mean, I'm I'm no expert, but I don't think there's a lot of trumpet groupies out there. <laughs> there may be a few, but I think you know you're better off with a guitar. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting to me that you mentioned that whole idea of um, the influence that your dad had on you, sort of by osmosis when it came to music. I, it was something very similar with me, in that I remember as a kid the music filling my house when dad would be cooking dinner or doing projects around the house. He would always have the stereo cranked and, and he would have uh, one of his albums playing or one of his CDs playing. And, and same thing for me, that was a huge influence and the ability to be able to uh, listen to those records, but be very, very careful, you know, always handle the vinyl by the edges. And for the love of God, make sure you put the record back in the same place you found it because like your dad and my dad's stuff was all alphabetized. And so again, it's just, it's really incredible how how much of an influence that can have on you well and also like if you you know you saw your dad's passion for the music and, and how the ritual and being careful and really respecting um the, the 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 format that you were using which was vinyl at the time um there's a you know we i i you're probably like me we look up to our father you know and and it's like i wanted to be he he was everything to me you know and he he loved it so much so that's probably for me what, what made me want to do it too is I, I wanted that love from my, my father. I wanted him to, you know, and I never understood why he didn't play. He's got a tremendous ear if he just dedicated himself uh, to, to, to picking up the instrument, you know, and I've gotten him guitars over the years and I've, I've showed him a few things, but it's really about, you got to want it bad enough. Cause you know, it hurts your, I remember when your dad was teaching you guitar, how your fingers felt on the end. I mean, it's painful, mm -hmm. especially acoustic guitars are hard to play. And if you don't, my wife always says the the 
the the dream has to be bigger than the insecurity. If the insecurity is bigger than the dream, then the dream will never be realized. And my dream was huge. I didn't think about whether I was going to be good or not or what people would think. I just wanted to play. I wanted to create music, you know, and it was uh, over time it comes. And as you know, anything we practice at, it comes. So prior to our conversation today, of course, I'm I'm reading your bio on your website. Want to learn about things that you've done, things that we can talk about, things we can discuss. And there's a line on the bio that just stood out to me that I feel like there's a story here that has to be shared. At age 16, he had the opportunity to jam with Bruce Springsteen. And now I'm thinking back to what I was doing at age 16, and it was nowhere near that cool. Uh, So again, I feel like there's a story that needs to be shared here. Yeah, it's, you know, listen, uh, the music business and it's it's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on, right? We want to exaggerate our stories, but this was a different kind of story because um, so basically it goes like this. I, I moved from Vegas to Portland. My mom, I was having trouble in school and my mom said, come live with, with her and her husband. And her husband is a guy still to this day. His name is David Phillips. David Phillips' sister Julianne Phillips, who's an actress and a model uh, at the time. She's, I don't think she's, she's still in the business, but she married Bruce Springsteen in 1985, right? I'm 15 years old at the time, um, not 16 yet. I, I don't know why the bio says 16, but I got my, my mom tells me Bruce is coming to the house tonight and, and you can't tell anybody at school. You have to stay quiet because the press was all over this, this thing in Lake Oswego and in Portland. And um, so I went to school and I came home and, I, and again, at that age, you know, in 1985, Bruce was huge right before this, he went out on that world tour, which really blew him, blew him up. But this is when born in the USA was big. Again, I was not really into Bruce Princeton, nor did I know his history or his, his talent for songwriting. I didn't, I didn't have any of that star stuff going on with Bruce Princeton. I knew he was big, you know, but I didn't realize. And he came over to our house to watch. Uh, it was a trailblazer uh, basketball um, uh, championship game. He came over and watched the game. We had pizza. And then he went down. My bedroom was down in the, in the basement and he came downstairs. I had a, I had a 1983 Ibanez Roadster. It was like seafoam green with a whammy bar on it. You know, and Bruce is a real traditionalist, you know, so he wasn't impressed with that. But I had a little PV backstage plus amp and a couple of pedals. And he came down and we, and we, for, for a little over an hour, we played, we, we traded the guitar back and forth. He showed me stuff. I showed him stuff. And he didn't know how to use the whammy bar, nor did he give crap. You know, he really didn't care. And um, and my mom took pictures the whole time with an old camera. And it's so funny because I've got like 40 pictures or something. And they're and they're every single picture is blurry. Like there was something <laughs> on the lens. You can see it's Bruce. You can tell it obviously it's me and it's my guitar. But like that, you know, was really impactful, but not in the sense like the gravity of it now hits me. Back then, I just didn't, I didn't know. I didn't really know, you know? So that's, that's the Bruce Springsteen story. That is one of the coolest stories I've ever heard. It's just, it's mind blowing to me. I mean, again, at that point in his career, he, I mean, he was already big, but he was really blowing up with born in the USA and, and, and that whole thing that was going on at that time. And and you're just, you're hanging out with him, eating pizza, watching a basketball game and playing the guitar in your basement. It's cool. And the thing about him, too, first of all, we lived in a very, very modest. Uh, it was a town home. It was a couple of bedrooms, very small. Like, again, my bedroom was in the basement, you know, and um, he was so down to earth. And he, you know, like no era of any kind of he just was he, he didn't he didn't feel he, no way would you ever think if you met this guy that he was Bruce Springsteen. He was just so chill, such a good human. You know, he really, really was a down to earth guy. And I looking back, I, I appreciate that even more so. And crazier than that, when I when I first moved back to Vegas, Vegas, because I left Vegas for a little while. I left Vegas for 15 years from 2000 to 2015. I, 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 I moved around a little bit. And uh, when I came back, a producer named Dick Feeney had a, had a new show on the strip that was coming out called the world's greatest rock show. And, and one of the acts was Bruce Springsteen. And he called me out of the blue and said, Hey, I want you to audition for this role. And I said, what is it? He goes, I think you can do Bruce Springsteen. And I thought, yeah, really? He's like, yeah, man, you kind of got the jaw and you, you, the way you sing, you're rough like that. And I never even considered that. So I, I went and auditioned just out as a courtesy. I, I really, I was focused on Reckless in Vegas. I wasn't going to you know, derail my plans to go do a show for somebody else. Um, but I went and auditioned. I didn't have any pressure on me because I didn't really want it. 
And about two weeks later, he called me, said, we auditioned 40 or 50 guys. You were the best. You got the job. Here's what it pays. Here's the schedule. And I said, let me think about it. And I thought, you know, I want to, I wanted reckless in Vegas to be a full production show at some point. That was the original vision. I had never had any experience being part of a full cast show. So I thought there'd be a lot to learn there and the money wasn't bad either. So I went ahead and I took the gig and I did it for six months. He agreed to work around my reckless in Vegas dates that I had booked at the time. And I learned a lot from that. And I got to be, I got to be Bruce in the show. And in doing that is when I became a Bruce Springsteen fan because um, I, I went ahead and, and broke down the music and really analyzed the songwriting. And I took all of his songs and I learned them on the piano or acoustic guitar. And I, the melodies and the storytelling, the craft, the guy is brilliant. It's he's brilliant, you know, and, and I really have a great respect. That's the appreciation respect I wish I had back in 1985, you know, so but that's that's that, that completes the Bruce part. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about your life and career pre reckless in Vegas. I mean, you, you worked with a lot of different bands. You did a lot of different stuff. You performed in a lot of different places. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of the experiences that you had through the journey up to reckless in Vegas. Yeah. Well, you know, I started playing in cover bands around 16 and, uh, and I was a guitar player and, uh, the, we were rehearsing just some cover songs, but this is before we even played out really. And, um, uh, the singer didn't show up and, and I said, Oh, I'll, I'll sing it. So I sang that weekend and, you know, in, in, in my living room at my dad's house at the time. And then the second weekend came and the kid didn't show up again. And I said, Oh, I'll do it. Then the third weekend, I told the guys that I wanted to be the singer because I was enjoying it. And, and they said, well, we're, we don't want to play with you then if you're going to be the singer. Cause I was a terrible singer. And, but I, but, but again, I didn't have insecurity around it. My dream was bigger than the insecurity and that those guys quit that bass player and drummer quit on me. And I got a couple other guys together. And then I got asked to be, to join another co an, a, a cover band that was already out playing. And that was my first experience playing in, in bars and stuff. I was, you know, I don't know, almost maybe 17 and we started doing cover songs, all of our favorite music. And I continued to do that until I was about 20. Um, and then I got together with a group of guys that were better musicians and, 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 the, and the, the, our cover songs. And we became a pretty good cover band. And it, it, in 1996, uh, these guys were songwriters, too. So we organically started to write original music and we would insert them into the cover band show. And we because we tricked the audience by only giving them an original and then all the songs that they knew about, we, we thought that our original music was better than it was because everybody knew the words and they sang along and it was a big party. Unbeknownst to us that it was only because we bookended them with two hit songs that we did not write. Um, but in 1996, we, we put a, we recorded a, a, an album uh, at a place called RMS Studios and the band was called Trip. And we put out our first album uh, and I decided no more covers and we're now going to be an original band. And our crowds went from 300 to 50. We went to South by Southwest that year. Uh, I got a, I got a music attorney that said you needed to read Donald Passman's everything you need to know about the music business. And you need to go to South by Southwest before I'll represent you. And South by Southwest was, was definitely um, enlightening to say the least, because we went there with our CD in hand and, you know, got in 1996, not a lot of bands had CDs, especially local level bands. So we really thought, or I thought we were, we were the shit we have arrived. We, you know, we are rock stars. And when I got to South by Southwest, we, we literally saw 150 bands perform there that were so far advanced from where we were at. They blew our, literally blew our doors off. They were so good and you had never heard of any of them. And instead of it, it could have shut me down, but instead it inspired me and it inspired me and the guys, the guys were like, let's get this down. Let's, let's, let's get to that level. Uh, so it right sized us, if you will, our egos got, got right sized. We became more down to earth and, and we continued to write and record uh, that band ended up having some trouble. And so we kind of fell apart and I, I replaced guys as we went and I put together another lineup of that band trip. And I got a girl in the band because my idea was like a, a hip modern day kind of sunny and share. And in 98, we, we, we worked with producer Tom Fletcher and Tom helped us produce an album and take the songs that I had written and turn them into kind of duets with this really cute singer. She was 16 at the time and she was, a, she was a firecracker on stage. She came from kind of a musical theater background and she was really exciting to watch. And so all of a sudden now 
we're performing and showcasing and now we're getting record deal offers and the record deal. We also took that band to South by Southwest, but this time that band performed and we were really kind of uh, earning our way up. Uh, the thing was happening and the record deal offers were all pretty interesting. I didn't take any of them because uh, I was already in business with, I had a carpet cleaning company that was kind of financing the music thing, thing for us. And we were pretty invested into it at this point. And the, the offers we were getting were, Basically, it wasn't the band. The, the record deals were Michael Shapiro, and they were seven album deals, like you know, seven hundred thousand dollars, and everything was on me. And I had to produce the music uh, to, to complete the contract. And I, they, they were bad. They took fifty percent of everything. They weren't good deals. Bottom line, that band actually broke up because of of my behavior. It, I was getting into drugs a little bit. I was getting pretty arrogant and cocky, and I wasn't managing life well, nor the relationships within the band. And I was turning down these deals that these that the band members thought were going to going to maybe take us to the next level and that thing fell apart and then in 2000 uh i really got strung out on cocaine and and that's when i moved i moved to portland uh back to portland again and uh did you know that they have cocaine in strip clubs in portland <laughs> i was shocked weird i was shocked that they had that stuff there uh, there's an expression everywhere everywhere i go there i am right and so i did yeah. the same behavior there i did put together a new band there with a couple of guys we were a trio under the name trip as well uh we put out an album tom fletcher came to portland and helped me produce that album and then he got us out with the band great white out on tour uh, and then that's when the Rhode Island fire happened in 2003. You know, 100 people died. Uh, just a tragic, tragic event. And um, and I came home and got back into my addiction. And then I got my act together. Um, I formed another band and produced a solo, my first solo album in 2005. I went out with the band Live. A great, great rock band. Uh, big, big in the 90s. I did a tour with those guys. But I didn't, I couldn't stay on the straight and narrow. I kept on slipping back into the drug thing and i kept derailing all the efforts at that time we had a record deal with universal fontana we had uh uh rogers and cow was our publicity company and and you know it was happening we were the my single on the album got uh it was getting uh, it was 1100 spins a week it was the number three most added in the country like it was really my dream since i was a kid was starting to come to fruition but I didn't have a good foundation in recovery at that time. And, and I kept putting my career is the most important thing in my life. And, 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 and that, when that thing crumbled at the end of the tour, I really went to a dark place. And that's when I decided to check myself into a long-term treatment center. And it happened to be in the Bay area where I was born and where my family's from. And I, it was a seven month program, but I learned to put my, my, uh, my recovery and my spirituality and my self-care in front of everything, my relationships, my career, anything that, 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 that could possibly come up. And ever since I've been, I've been cleaning the suburb for 16 years. I just celebrated 16 years, October 1st. Um, and then, and I formed a band in the Bay area and that was the beginning of what we are now known as reckless in Vegas. And I was with a couple different guys. We played with, uh, a uh, different couple different drummers. Uh, we put an album out in, in 2008 with producer Dan Shea, who happened to be my neighbor in the Bay Area. Uh, Dan's known for uh, Mariah Carey, Jennifer Lopez, Jessica Simpson, a lot of pop stuff. But he helped me with the, the first EP that Reckless in Vegas did in 2008. And then we got a different, a di little bit different lineup, different drummer. Um, actually, the whole, a complete different lineup because we were a trio. So I'm the only existing member. So Mario Cipollina from Huey Lewis and the News became the bass player. And Ryan Lowe became the drummer. And we did an album with Sylvia Massey up in Weed, California. Sylvia's known for Tool and Dishwalla and Johnny Cash, incredible producer. And we put that out and we toured. And, 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 then, and then I got the idea to uh, basically do what we're doing. Um, our booking agent at the time, we just weren't making a living. We just weren't able to turn. We would go out and tour every three months doing the originals. And basically, you know, from from uh, we did Oregon, California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, you know, that just kind of that Utah, Las Vegas, Arizona. We kind of did that little circle and it wasn't working. And the booking agent we were working with at the time suggested that we do a tribute show because tribute acts at the time were making a lot of money. So we learned 50 Johnny Cash songs change the key for my voice because i'm not as low as johnny and 
And uh, we just couldn't do it. I couldn't find the fulfillment in it. It was too, you know, barren digger, barren digger, barren digger, barren digger, every song. And I just thought, oh, my God, I, I, I sure will make a living, but I won't be fulfilled as, a, as a, an original songwriter. So we shelved the idea and I was meditating. And I was I had a big meditation practice every day at that time in my life. And I got this vision and and it was reckless in Vegas and neon lights. And it was like black and white old Vegas video montages playing. And there were dancers and we're wearing shark skin suits. And I'm playing my Les Paul and we're playing our style of, of uh, power trio rock, uh, kind of a Green Day thing we were doing at the time. And uh, but I'm singing Frank Sinatra. And the first thing that I did was call our producer, our first producer, uh, Dan Shea, Dan did something on the first album. We had, we had a five song EP that we were going to do with Dan. Dan called me about halfway through and said, do you know, do you know Neil Diamond's solitary man? I said, I know the song. I've never played it. He goes, learn and come over here. He wanted to make that as a the sixth song on the first EP and make that do, do a remake version of Neil Diamond solitary man. Well, we did that in 2008. So now we're now, now it's 2012. And I got this vision. I called Dan back and I said, Dan, you remember the thing we did with Neil Diamond? He goes, yeah. I go, what do you think about doing that with old Vegas music? And a year later, we put out the album. We put out the album the hard way. We started playing it around the Bay Area, and it was a smash. And it's just right out of the gate. Even when we weren't playing it that well yet, it was just great. And I knew I was on to something, and then Vegas got wind of it. And I was getting some hotel owners calling us and coming to see us play in San Jose and around the Bay Area. And in 2014, we got hired to come to Vegas to do a five-week uh, residency at the Downtown Grand. And that's kind of what started the whole thing, and that's what prompted me to move back to Las Vegas, to Las Vegas in 2015. For those who aren't familiar with the style of music that you guys do, it's it's so cool. My first exposure to you guys was um, a Monday's Dark anniversary show. And uh, I remember you guys came out on stage and you, you you hit the stage and instantly I just thought, this is the coolest shit I've ever heard. And I, and I was with my wife and, and I, I know we both just turned and looked at each other. And we're just like, wow, this, this is incredible. Do you remember what tune? Off the top of my head, I do not recall. Oh, anniversary show. It was okay. So anniversary show, we've only done one anniversary show. So it was at the joint, right? Yes, it was at the joint. Yes. It was luck be a lady. Yes, it was. I remember it now. And, and, and as I say, you guys, you absolutely friggin' killed it. It's that that particular arrangement. Um, did Dan Dan came up with that that riff, right? It's that do 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 do, and it's super dark, and it's very Metallica, and it's it. You really would exp- I would explain it like, what would it be like if Metallica, uh, you know, sang with uh, perform with Frank Sinatra singing "Love Be a Lady," and that's kind of what that particular arrangement is. And and that night you saw it. You know, we have a horn section in the show now. We never had that before. I always wanted it. But the night you saw that was we added a horn section to it because the horn section from Monday's Dark, it was uh, Isaac Tubb and Kevin Mullinex and Rob Stone on saxophone. Uh, Isaac's the trumpet player. Kevin is the trombone player. Uh, Isaac said, hey, let me write a horn arrangement for the for that song. And I thought, OK, that's interesting. I, I, I'll check it out. And. Isaac's funny because he's very, very busy. He's the music director of Matt, uh, uh, Matt Apple now. And he's just a, he's he's sought out all over town. And he had promised me along the way that he would he would send me the track so I could hear what he was writing. Well, we got all the way to that day that you saw the show. And it was the first time I heard the horn arrangement was actually during soundcheck. And I was very nervous about it because I didn't want some marching band crap in there. I wanted not that that's crap, but for, for what I was going for, I didn't want that. And, and, and when he p- began to play it, I was so relieved how cool it was. Like he really nailed that arrangement. And, and that was a fun, you know, that was like 3000 people. That was a pretty big show. Yeah. So it was pretty high energy right out of the gate, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, thank you for appreciating the arrangements and, and what we do. You know, it gets lost on some people and it's uh, our heart and soul is in this. And we've really been careful to craft these in a way in our style that's you know classic and modern rock combined but also very importantly playing paying homage to the original versions you know the the, the melodies and the and the lyrics and and presenting them in a in a way that tradi- traditionalists could be proud of them as well well and i think the cool thing about what you guys are doing as well is that they're not just standard covers not to take anything away from what cover bands do and and you yourself having been involved with cover bands for as long as you are know how 
how tough of a slog that can be. But the fact that you guys are taking some of these classic songs that people know and love and putting your own spin and your own arrangement on them just makes it that much cooler. Yeah, we, we you know, it's, it's so I often think of Frank Sinatra or, or, or even El, think about Elvis for a second. I mean, those were, you know, technically those were his interpretations of somebody's songwriting, right? Uh, a lot, there's a lot of artists that don't write music and they, you're we're, what we're hearing in some of the hits and over the years in life, it, we're hearing an interpretation, whether it's directed by a producer or, or directed by a songwriter to the artist, it's an interpretation. And, and as far as arrangements go, um, yeah, these are original arrangements. We do do a few mashups, which is more on the cover range where we take uh and you know this, but but I'll say it for, for your listeners. Um, we'll take Sammy Davis Jr.'s uh, Mr. Bojangles, and we kind of, the Nitty Gritty Band made that song really mainstream. Um, we kind of took the Nitty Gritty Band's vibe, and we put it, we, we mashed it up with Jimi Hendrix's Manic Depression. And, you know, that sounds shocking, but it works incredibly well. And, and then another mashup is we took Frank Sinatra's A Very Good Year, and we mashed it up with, uh, Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit, that the music bed is White Rabbit, the lyrics and melody are, are a very good year. And the, the, the more recent one that, that, that I came up with was uh, I always wanted to do Nancy Sinatra's Boots Are Made for Walking, but I didn't really want to write an arrangement around it. And Dan Shea didn't really have anything for it. So we shelved it for a while. I woke up one morning and in my head, I heard Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love. And I thought, this could work. And I went into the studio and I mashed them together. Not, they happened to be in the same key, which made my job a lot easier. But, you know, hearing Boots Are Made for Walking over a whole lot of love. I mean, it blows people's minds. And other than those three mashups, every other arrangement we do is original music. The music is original. And that's, you know, going back to the Johnny Cash tribute thing, that wasn't going to stimulate my inner artist. But this thing that we're doing now, it's original music. So it, it really does kind of get the both the best of both worlds if you will after the break we talk about how reckless in vegas is giving back to the community with a very cool charitable initiative and michael shares how the residency at the sahara came to be that's next on jeff does vegas Let's talk about landing the residency at the Sahara. Congratulations on that, by the way. I think that is such a, a cool place for you guys to be with a, a property that's got a lot of history behind it. Why is it that the Sahara is the right fit for Reckless in Vegas and Reckless in Vegas is the right fit for the Sahara? You know, it's interesting because right before COVID, I was talking to the entertainment director at the Sahara uh, and we were we we went around and round for about eight months trying to get a deal on there, and we just couldn't get it contracted. We couldn't agree on some stuff. And at that same time, um, uh, enter- an entertainment director for Caesars reached out to me, and I had been working with 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 that person for a while too. And um, he called me and said, "Hey, we got a deal for you." So while I was struggling with Sahara at the time, I went and met this guy for coffee at at the Link, uh, which is owned, was owned by Caesars, and. They offered us two rooms. They offered us the Mount Franco room, which is about 600 capacity, which I thought was too big for us. You know, I don't want to try to have, it'd just be impossible for us to fill that room. And then he showed us a little space in the back that they wanted to turn into a small 120 seat cabaret room. And I took the deal with them. We said, let's do it. So we started building the room. We were supposed to open up April 11th or something of, of, of 2021. And, uh, and of course, that's when um, COVID hit. So the whole deal got shelved and then Caesars got bought out by El Dorado and El Dorado decided to cancel all the smaller shows. And of course not complete the construction of the room that we were going to be in. So I got a phone call kind of out of the blue from a guy that I grew up with. Uh, his name's Pete Longy and he happens to be the assistant casino manager at Sahara during that period. Um, they had done a restructure at Sahara and they brought in new people and they got rid of some of the old people that entertainment director I was working with had, had left and there's a new team in there and, and Pete pitched us to upper management and they came and saw us play at the Italian American club and they said, let's do a deal. And so it took us a little while to put it together, but basically it was through a friend, somebody that I grew up with who happened to work at the hotel. He was unaware that we were already talking to Sahara a couple of years prior, right? He didn't even know about that. So it's funny how things kind of work out. You know, I always try to align myself with the universe's yeses and, and, you know, I'm a, 
I'm a square peg and a round hole kind of guy, unfortunately. So, so I, I do, I do put, put a lot of self will on things, but as I've gotten older, I've learned to kind of let things kind of take their course. And Sahara really was a kind of an organic thing, the way that it happened the second time. Uh, we love the property. We love Alex Morello's vision of, uh, of, of also paying homage to vintage Vegas and the things that really built this city and made our city what it is today. Um, but then making it kind of, you know, beautiful and modern and, and the place is elegant. As you know, you've seen the property. It's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. They put a ton of money into it and it's on the North end of the strip. It's interesting to me or ironic, if you will, that it's, it's, it's on Sahara on Las Vegas Boulevard, which is literally the middle of, 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 of town. And it's also, it's the zero of town. Las Vegas Boulevard is zero. And so is Sahara is zero for East, West, North, South. And if you go North of Sahara, it's old Vegas, right? It takes you downtown and the art district. And that's old. That's, that's old. It's, it's literally where old meets new. If you go South, now you have the strip and, and that's kind of what we do. We're old meets new. And I think Sahara was on brand with that and our brand, uh, naturally fit it without having to change it. My whole life, I've had A&R guys or entertainment directors or talent buyers try to change what we do. And this particular deal was none of that. It was like, we love what you do and we want to do this with you. And that's a big yes for me. I remember when Caesars made that decision to pull the plug on all those smaller shows and shows like Tenors of Rock and Bronx Wanderers and Crazy Girls all went kaput and and they shut down Cleopatra's Barge and the Cabaret at Paris. And and it seemed like they were going to be moving away from that smaller scale live entertainment. Do you feel like you kind of maybe dodged a bullet by not ending up as a part of the Caesars family? I would think so. I mean, we dodged a bullet with Sahara too the first time because it wasn't, you know, it's funny if you push too hard, we can achieve the goals, but are the goals our highest potential? You know, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, you got to kind of wait for the timing to be right. Timing is so important. Um, yeah, I do. Because even if we were doing well, they probably would have, would have, would have shelved it. Right. Because of the plans that this, you know, that's the thing with big corporations, you know, they kind of do what they they do what they do. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, it's hard. I, that was another thing we liked about Sahara. It's a little bit smaller, you know, smaller deal. Um, uh, a little easier, a little more hometown feel, you know, if I have a challenge, I can take it to, to management and talk to them about it. it. doesn't have to go through 47 departments before you hear back. And these bigger companies, you know, they're, they're good at what they do, but it's tough. You can get lost in the mix and let's just, just let's be, be, let's call it brass tacks. We're a very small show. Uh, not a big revenue maker, you know, we're, we, we have a great product and, and it's a very cool amenity, but really, you know, in this business, uh, nobody's going to care as much as we care. And we've got partners in Sahara that, that, that have stepped up for us in ways that other places would not have. So yeah, to, to answer your question in long form, yes. And something I think people need to realize about a, a reckless in Vegas show as well is that it's more than just a concert. I mean, people are getting, a show out of this. You have got backup singers, you've got a horn section, you've got choreography, you've got video presentation. Again, it's really, it's, it's more than just, just a concert. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the way this thing started too. We were a trio, you know, playing in, in, in clubs in San Francisco and, but the original vision that I had that day, and I wrote everything down. Um, the only thing that wasn't in the vision was the horn section. Right. And we've added, I've added that. And I felt like the show was pretty good, but it, there was something missing in it. And, and we brought the horns in and it sort of polished it as a, as a Vegas show. Uh, we're not, we're not Cirque du Soleil. We don't have aerialists and, you know, we're not the Jersey boys where there's this incredible history story that runs through it. The story is really about my life and my family and growing up in Vegas and the change in Vegas. And it talks about the mob and of course, we have the arrangements. We have the dancers. There's a little bit of theatrics in it, but nothing heavy. It's really about the music. It's about the music. This show is for people who love music and want to hear something different. It's unique, but accessible. Uh, people who love rock and roll will love this stuff. People who love the old uh, traditional versions of these songs will love this show, too. It's lightning in a bottle because we all know rock and roll is youthful. We're getting a little older now, but it's still it, it's got this energy, a youthful energy to it. Um, we hope that, that people will come take a chance on reckless in Vegas and see the show because they don't know what it is and haven't heard of it, that they'll come and just be pleasantly surprised about what it is. I'm so proud 
of the cast and everybody who's been part of creating and producing it. And, um, uh, you know, it takes a huge village to put the show on and even get it to where it, where it is. And, and I've got, I, I think I have the greatest, I'm surrounded by the greatest support system and cast members that, that ever was. And, and it's just a joy. We all look forward to going to work. We look forward to playing for audiences. The audience have, have been, have been fantastic. The reviews are nice to read. You know, I'm still trying to find one a bad review somewhere. I can't find one yet. I know that one will come at some point, but um, it's just been a really, really incredible experience. And my heart is so full of gratitude, you know, for this for this venture. And something else that you've done with the show, too, which I think is just so cool, is you've been inviting some guest performers to come and join you to be a part of the show. There's so much talent in Las Vegas. I just, just, just world class talent. And and I've over the years and this and over the seven years that I've been back, I've met some just incredible performers and worked with performers. And and being on stage with somebody uh, that that has their own style and their own craft, and they're doing shows or they're doing what they're playing characters on their shows, but they're also original artists as well. And I wanted to create a platform for them to be who they wanted to be. And it's funny because we, uh, Kelly Clinton Holmes was the first person that we did boots are made for walking with. And she had her, she has her style. You know, I never, I never coached her on how to show up. I wanted her to be authentic in her own, own craft. And as we brought another guest, they're like kind of wonder, do they need to do it like the other other artists that was that we had? And I'm like, I, I, I implore them, do what you do with what we do. That's where the magic is. And when I see that come to life every time we bring in a new guest, uh, Elizabeth Diaga started in June and then we had Kelly Clinton Holmes in July. Um, and then we had Ann Martinez in August, September. We had Nikki Scalera. This, uh, uh, this month, um, we uh, start with Kelly Vaughn. So it's interesting to see their takes. And again, they're all so different. You know, Nikki Scalera is Broadway. And Ann Martinez is Broadway, but she's a rocker. And uh, Elizabeth Diaga, straight rocker. But Elizabeth has another story. She also um, does this incredible jazz style that is in her heart. So it's just a platform for, for, for them to express themselves doing what we do. It's been truly a joy to work with a different artist every, every month. And then also we wanted to also stimulate the local audience or people who come back to Vegas, you know, the, to see somebody, somebody different in the show. It's been so fun to do it. Um, I also am a guy who really finds comfort in structure and consistency. And I feel like that's limiting as a human being. And so I challenge myself with mixing up the pot, uh, throwing in a different drummer, bringing in different horn players, trying to mix it up to where it scares me a little bit. Like I don't have that comfort zone because when I'm in my comfort zone, I tend to get complacent. So by mixing it up, it causes me to be on my toes, which magic happens. And I'm learning to embrace that more because there's so many things in life we can't control or, you know, that I'm powerless over. And this is one area by bringing in different guests every month that I get to explore that a little bit more. Um, also, the, 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 the Reckless in Vegas Annie F Collective that we started, which also every month we get a different sponsor that agrees to uh, donate a, a certain amount per ticket sold for the entire month to a local charity. And that's been really successful. We've, we've uh, donated uh, just about $10,000 to St. Jude's Ranch for Children, thanks to our sponsors and our collective. That makes me feel really good being on stage, knowing that we've got money going to charity when we're playing, you know, every ticket gets purchased. And, you know, I got that idea. I was always inspired by your buddy, Mark Chinook in Monday's Dark. From the moment I moved to Las Vegas and I saw the work he was doing, I thought that was great and an important part of my recovery process and me being, uh, you know, um, showing up and, and contributing to the planet is giving back. And Mark, Mark's platform was so inspiring. So we sort of morphed some of that into what we what we do. And you know what? I think that that's something that that is constantly surprising people is how charitable Las Vegas actually is. The city is a city of excess. It's it's a city that's known as Sin City. But I know anytime I talk to any of my friends about the charity work that the the various entertainment friends of mine do in Las Vegas, they're always just blown away by how giving everyone is. Well, we're excessive in our charitable aspect. There you go. We are. It's you know, it's also the the the, the entertainment community here is really involved. They're hands on. They they we do care about our community here. And and when you see the power of of synergy happen with a group of people, and you see its effectiveness, it's inspiring in itself. So it continues to perpetuate itself, really. And and yeah, and I 
I think I think there's a lot of really amazing communities around the world and, and, and people step up, you know, and it's really beautiful. Um, life is challenging. Life is impossible alone. We got to work together. You know, when we work together, uh, despite political views or religious views or whatever that may be, if we just find the common denominator and unite everybody, we can work together, you know, get out of ego. And, and, and whatever the goal or purpose is, you know, when we work together, one plus one equals three. You know, it's not two, it's three. We get more out of it. If people want to learn more about you and your bandmates and Reckless in Vegas and, of course, uh, get their hands on tickets to the show, how can people go about doing that? Well, we're on every ticket platform in town, but the easiest way is to go to RecklessInVegas.com. Um, that will direct uh, everybody to our social media as well as uh, ways to buy tickets. Um, and then you can go to Sahara, Las Vegas also, uh, if they need to book rooms or anything. They can go there and we're on that site as well. Uh, Ticketmaster is the, it's a Ticketmaster room. So they're, they're the, uh, primary ticket seller for the show, but there, there are deals to be had at Vegas.com and some of the other discount brokers. So, so if you do, if, if, if you do decide to want to come to the show, um, you know, shop around a little bit, try to get that best deal, you know? And if people want to get a little sneak peek of your music, you guys are available for streaming and download as well. Yeah, we are. We're on Spotify and uh, Apple Music. And uh, I can't keep up with all, all of them. But yeah, pretty much every platform there is. Excellent. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for taking time to jump on and uh, have a conversation. And I look forward to getting down to Vegas and checking out the show. Yes, Jeff. Thank you so much. And anytime you're welcome as our guest. <laughs> Once again, if you want to learn more about Reckless in Vegas and get your hands on tickets to see them live at the Sahara, visit their website at RecklessInVegas.com or follow the band on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Reckless in Vegas. You can also find Reckless in Vegas streaming online at Apple Music and Spotify. And of course, you can find all these links in the show notes at JeffDoesVegas.com. And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at JeffDoesVegas.com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production. Walker New Media.